Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is my privilege and joy to welcome you to Overbrook Presbyterian Church this morning. My name is Adam Hurlson, and I am one of the ministers here along with the rest of the church. If you are visiting us, we're glad that you are here. No matter where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. And if you'd like more information on what we are doing at this church, Carol, our Tech Magi is adding a link where you can provide some info and we can send you some details on the work of this good community. Today, we celebrate the second week of Advent. And thankfully, at three o'clock, we will be holding our first virtual Messiah hymn sing. It will be wonderful. You should all come. My favorite piece in Handel's music is the Comfort You solo. I, I suspect it probably has another name, and I believe that Taufer is going to sing it during the anthem. Um, it's a piece of music that's built from our scriptures for this morning. Comfort, comfort, oh my people, says the prophet. This is among the most familiar and beautiful of Advent scriptures. It was first written by an anonymous prophet in the 5th century BCE, and then voiced again by John the Baptist, spoken again and again throughout the ages, and then set to music by a prophet like Handel. It is a majestic and beautiful text. It's one of those texts that, as Augustine puts it, I can see the depths but I cannot get to the bottom. And that's my prayer for your worship today, that in church this morning and at the communion table and later as you listen and sing with Handel, I pray that you can see the depths, but that you cannot get to the bottom. And that in seeing those depths, you will feel, as the prophet said, comfort. So friends, let us worship God. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of peace. Overbrook Presbyterian Church, we are a people of peace. As the division and discord rages around us and in us, we stand affirmed in our call to be peacemakers in this world. We seek justice and love mercy so that peace might reign across our world. We are a people of peace. Loving God, in our waiting and our watching, we pray for peace. Peace in our hearts, peace in our families, and peace in our world. May the whole world be filled with your peace. In our waiting, may we notice your peace descending.
Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let us confess our sins against God and neighbor. Holy God, forgive us all the obstructions we have added to this world. Forgive us for making people go out of their way to see your glory. Forgive us for blocking access to your grace, your love, your mercy. Forgive us for failing to prepare your coming, for failing to make the path clear so that all might see and know that you are Lord and Savior to us all. Church, the good news of Advent is that Jesus Christ has come into the world, has led the way through death that we may have life, and is coming again to make all things new. And so as the mountain is laid low and the valley is made high, we might all experience the dawning <laughs> of the coming of the Lord. So hear the good news of the gospel again. Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The gospel is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Overbrook. My name is Hannah. My name is Aria. And my name is Bob. And I'm Anthony, and we are so happy that you have made it to church this morning for our children's message. Last week, we told a story about the people of God and how they were waiting for an end to their troubles. They had lost their homes, their temples, and even some of their friends. Even though this was a time of hardship and confusion, the people of God had hope that God had a plan to help them. And God did have a plan, a big plan. First, God would send a messenger to the people. And then God's messenger would call out to people from the wilderness. 
Get the world ready for God to come to us. Make God's path straight. One day, a messenger from God finally appeared, and he was called John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer was a unique messenger. He spent a lot of time outside in the wilderness. He ate foods that came straight from the earth. He wore clothes that reminded the people of the holy prophet Elijah, made of camel's hair and animal skin. The people of God listened to John's messages. He would gather them at the Jordan River and would say, People of God, remember, God is coming to us soon. This is fantastic news. We have to get ready. Turn to God and be baptized. Crowds went to John by the river, and they would tell him how they were waiting for an end to their troubles and how sorry they were for their mistakes. As God's messenger, John baptized them in the waters and gave them a fresh start. Some people wondered if John the baptizer was more than God's messenger, because John was saying and doing very powerful things with the people of God. But John replied with something important to them all. God is going to come to us soon, and God is much more powerful than me. See, I can only baptize you with water. Soon when God comes, God will baptize you with more than water. God will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So, the people of God kept waiting and preparing themselves for God to come, just as we wait and prepare this Advent season. Thank you so much, our storytellers. So friends out there, I wonder, as you listen to this story this morning, has God ever sent you a message before? I wonder what it sounded like. I wonder if that message felt very comforting. I wonder what God might have been saying to you in that moment. I wonder, what do you do when you receive a message from God? Do you listen to it? Do you pray with it? Do you try to do the thing God is telling you to do? I wonder, if God were to pay us a visit tomorrow, what would you do to prepare yourself? What are some actions you would take? Who might you want to tell about it? I wonder what it might be like to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. What would it sound like? What would it feel like? What might it taste like? Good questions. Friends, as we close our story this morning and we say goodbye, let's invite God's Holy Spirit into our hearts as we have a time of prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, while we light the Advent candles and decorate the house, we thank you for this magical time of Advent. God, thank you for, in a time of sickness, still letting us be able to see our friends over Zoom. And may everyone be safe over this time. Holy Lord, we ask that your spirit might call out to us with your message of hope and that you might prepare our hearts to receive your message of comfort and good news. God, help us to feel the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. Amen. Bye, friends.
voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Exalted shall be exalted, shall be exalted, shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill may flow. straight and the rock places plain and the rough places plain Thank you, Topper. Church, here again, the prophet Isaiah from the 40th chapter. Comfort, comfort, O my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. And the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom. And he will gently lead the mother sheep. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us play. Oh, good and gracious God, we pray that you would be among us, that your glory might be revealed to us in a time full of shadows. And as the nights grow long, O oh God, may your light pierce through it. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Our rock, our strength, our redeemer. Amen. In Laguna Beach, California, not far from where I grew up, a billionaire placed a million dollar glass sculpture in his yard, not far from some palm trees, which then in a storm shed some of those leaves that then fell on the million dollar glass sculpture, breaking a portion of it, which cost $100,000 to then fix. To prevent further damage, the billionaire then erected a large black net above the sculpture to catch the falling debris. And this net was then erected high enough that the other billionaire next door had a portion of his 180 degree ocean view obstructed by the net that was designed to catch the debris so that the million dollar glass sculpture that is for some reason outside under palm trees that routinely shed palm branches so that that sculpture wouldn't be damaged. In California, messing with someone's ocean view is the easiest way to instigate a fight. Lawyers got involved, of course. Tense words were exchanged, restraining orders were eventually filed. At one point, the billionaire with the sculpture turned on his stereo full volume and set the theme to Gilligan's Island on repeat. He then left the house, boarded his jet, and flew to another one of his other homes with a view. Now all of this is in the hands of some poor court who has to deal with fighting billionaires. Merry Christmas to them. These fights have become so common in California that cities and municipalities are trying to write thoughtful and fair laws to help mediate the fights. In Palos Verdes, another enclave for the outrageously wealthy in California, laws now allow you to restore previous views if your neighbor decided to plant a tree and then that tree, surprise, surprise, grew and is now obstructing your view. As a homeowner, then you have the right to tell the person to cut down their tree, which as you might imagine, doesn't lead to happy neighborhoods. Some years back, one poor guy collapsed with heart trouble in the midst of an impassioned plea to the city council to save his trees from being cut down. Another couple, upon having to cut down 37 pine trees from their property, decided to just move to San Diego. 
as reported by the LA Times next time, they said, we are going to be the ones on top. Isaiah 40 is about a nation losing a view, quite literally losing a view. Chapter 40 is the beginning of a brand new section of Isaiah's prophecy. It's a section that was written after the nation was conquered by the Babylonian army and displaced from their homes. It's a section written years and years after the first 39 chapters of the book. Chapter 40 is written by a prophet captive in Babylon and written for a people who have lost their view of God's city. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you, you know it sits high on a hill, and, and at the pinnacle of that hill was, was Solomon's temple. It was the very center of Jewish religious life. The temple was God's house, the place God promised to reside, and anywhere in Jerusalem, you could lift your eyes up and you could see God's temple. When the Babylonians arrived, they lit that temple on fire and they burned it to the ground. Displaced in Babylon, the, the nation of Israel can no longer see the temple of Solomon rising from the highest point of Jerusalem. They can no longer draw hope from its presence and from the God who resided within it. To make matters worse, the last time they saw the temple, it was a smoldering pile of ashes. They would lift their eyes up and see only a plume of smoke rising from what once was the center of their world. Now, at the time of the writing of the prophet, years later, the memory of their lost view is still a tender bruise. And their view of Babylon is a bitter drink. And most of the time when the Israelites thought of the future, they thought mostly about revenge. They composed songs about the violence they would inflict on the Babylonians. Like the family moving to San Diego. Next time, next time their fantasies assured them they would be the ones on top. They would be the ones doing the cutting and the burning they would fight and they would claw until they got their view back. Isaiah 40 is written to a people broken by the world and longing for their former view. It's written to a people displaced and alienated from God, written by an anonymous prophet at least 150 years after Isaiah had died. And this prophet takes up the images of Isaiah and speaks not of violence, not of returning to the top, but of a coming savior who will return the people to their land. This Messiah, this savior will come as a comforter. Comfort, comfort, oh my people, the chapter begins. Indeed, the prophet assures the people that this savior is on his way right now. The prophet then provides this, this amazing image, an image reprised by John the Baptist nearly 500 years later in the wilderness that is in Babylon, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And the point of this image here is speed, because ancient roads are winding. Traveling puts people at the mercy of the road. But if, if God is coming, we need God to come quickly. We need, we need straight roads. Growing up, we would, my family, drive north from California to Oregon to see my grandmother. And typically, we would take one of two routes. The five freeway was a straight shot through the center of California over the flat farmlands of the state. The Pacific Coast Highway traced the windy coast of California. The Pacific Coast Highway is the most beautiful stretch of highway on God's green earth, but it takes forever. If you need to get through California in a hurry, take the five. 
prepare ye the way of the Lord, get the GPS to send the Messiah down I-5, because, because when you're desperate, you can't afford for your Savior to take the scenic route. When you are in bondage, every minute counts. When people are dying at an alarming rate all around you, you can't afford to wait. The prophet continues, this time with another profound image. An image about a view. The prophet says, every, every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then, the scriptures say, then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all people shall see it together. And all people shall see it together. By the power of this Messiah, by the strength and majesty of the coming God, the world will bend. And those living in the shadow of the mountain and the shadow of the valley will see the coming light. This is a scripture about the view about how God will make a world where we all collectively notice and see the glory dawning on a common horizon. As God comes, we don't have to fight for the view. We don't have to claw to be on top. We don't have to take each other to court. Not when the mountains are being made low and the valley is lifted up. Not when the whole world can see the breaking dawn. I love this image. I love this image, not just because I need to see a little light break into the shadows of our world right now. Because in the midst of those shadows, I find this image empowering. Because as you know, waiting is hard. Thinking to yourself, uh, another week, maybe another week, maybe, 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 maybe another week. And I know that for some, you long for a view of our sanctuary, for a choir processing, for kids flooding the chancel, for an advent wreath glowing with lights. as the valleys begin to rise and the mountains start to lower, I am reminded that I can hold on a bit longer and I can be a bit more courageous in my waiting. You see, lowering the mountains and raising the valleys allows us to see the coming Savior from far off. And that provides, well, it provides comfort. And Christian faith has always been about living in the time of seeing Christ far off coming, on his way, imminent. Salvation is coming. Look down the road. You can see it come. Knowing that salvation is imminent gives us strength to hold on for today and to help others hold on. It empowers us to love extravagantly, to not hold anything back for further waiting, to make sure that this close to coming salvation, no one gets lost before they experience the joy of God's salvation. And I find this, this image and this message empowering because it directs our mission, our work, both in and out of a pandemic, because our goal as Christians, as those who proclaim a coming Savior, is to make sure that people get to see the glory. And I think about the woman who takes three buses to get to a place where she can buy vegetables for her family because she lives in an urban food desert. And I hear the prophet Isaiah make straight in the desert a highway. And I think about our LGBTQ neighbors denied the common dignity to celebrate their love. And in the modern Hebrew, the words, every valley shall be exhausted, translates literally to every gay person will get married. That works for me. 
And I think about the people buried below a mountain of death unable to see much of anything but the shame and stigma of being a debtor. Some of you know this mountain. And lately, churches all over this country have been trying to lay this mountain low. Some months back in Philly, Dream of Schaefer was buried beneath medical debt. Debt incurred from an injury to her son and her own battle with osteoporosis from an emergency where she stopped breathing. And the debt grew because she couldn't pay it. And for years, those bills piled up. And she'd throw a few dollars at them, but really she lived paycheck to paycheck. And then one day a yellow envelope arrived informing her that her debt had been wiped out. She said, I happened to get that letter two weeks after I ran away from an abusive relationship. I literally started crying. It was the best thing that happened to me in a long time. You see, a few years ago, two debt collectors, people who, who used to get rich by pulling a few more dollars from those without a few dollars to give, decided to use their powers for good. They formed a nonprofit called RIP Medical Debt. They now buy medical debt from medical companies for a fraction of the debt. And so $1 buys $1,000 worth of debt. And churches around the, work, around the country work with RIP medical debt and they crowdfund for their neighborhoods and they buy up these large chunks of medical debt. One large church in Cincinnati just wiped out $46 million of debt for people in Ohio and in Kentucky. See it? This is what it looks like to make a mountain low. It's what it looks like to give people a chance to see the coming of the Lord besides the growing mountain. Because then, then, once the mountain is laid low, the prophet says, the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all the people will see it together. All of us, all the people enjoying the view together, unobstructed by nets or marred by blaring theme songs, not one on top or another on the bottom, but all of us, shoulder to shoulder, washed in the holy light of God's salvation. Comfort, comfort, indeed. Amen. Oh, so
on to a time of announcements. Next week, we as a church will be holding an all church meeting after services to elect a new slate of elders and deacons and next year's nominating committee. The meeting will take immediately after the benediction of the church of service. Additionally, we will be holding a, a vote on some bylaw changes that will then allow us to hold an all church meeting online. Expect an email this week detailing the language to that bylaw change and the nominating committee's nominations for 2021. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, our Messiah Sing will take place at 3 p.m. today. This will be a virtual sing, and I encourage everyone to participate from their homes. Even if you don't sing, you can come and listen. Carol will add a link to that in our chat room, but more information is on our church website as well. The holiday season can be an especially difficult and trying time, especially in a time of pandemic. On Monday, December 21st at 7 p.m., we will be holding our longest night service. This is a time to gather during this season as people experiencing grief and pain. We will acknowledge the pain of this time and we will be present with God. More info will be sent out soon, but if you are missing your loved ones this season, Come and be with your community for a time of prayer, a time of silence, and a time of music. Of course, we have lots of other amazing Advent opportunities upcoming. Those are all present on our website, and Carol will provide a link right now about our Advent offerings. I'm grateful that the work of the church continues. One thing to note is that our pageant cast list is now finalized. Roles and lines are sent out, were sent out this morning. And our first rehearsal for that pageant will be next Sunday, 12, 13 at noon. Additionally, we have a middle school and high school youth Christmas party via Zoom on uh, December 15th at 6 p.m. Encourage everyone who is in middle school and high school to come and participate uh, there are party packs available for that Christmas party at OPC during the vigil hours. Um, if you need one, you can email Anthony. Speaking of our work at the vigil on Thursday, we continue to stand at 2 p.m. until it gets dark to signal our commitment to racial justice in our city, in our country, and in our world. I encourage you to come and stand for justice and witness to God's love on our corner on Thursdays. Now, as people in need and as people blessed. Let us turn to God in prayer with thanksgiving and with supplication. I encourage everyone who has a prayer request to enter their prayer request into the chat room. I will open us in prayer and then Justin Robertson and Mary Lou Rice will pray, at which point then I will lift up the prayer request from the chat room. So church, let's join our hearts in prayer. Holy and loving God, in this Advent season, we wait. And as we wait, we pray that you would guide us to prepare, to prepare the way of the Lord. May our preparations be faithful. May our hands work for a more just and loving world. And may our lips Sing your praises as we do this work. And so now we ask you to hear the prayers of this community. Hear them as the sincere need and the sincere thanks of a people committed to you. Dear Lord, thank you for our hearts and minds. Thank you for each of the different abilities we have, Lord. And thank you for showing us that through the miracle of the birth of Jesus, that our own lives are also a miracle. Dear Lord, please help those who are suffering. Please help those who are mourning the, the death of loved ones. And dear Lord, please help us to realize what a gift you have given us with our minds because it gives us to pow the power to execute our will. And dear Lord, 
please help us to eliminate all other fears besides you so that we can be led away from apprehension and look towards ascension. Amen. Let us pray. Our holy God, we thank you for this gathering time to worship you. As we celebrate Advent together, we wait upon you. We pray to rest in the joy of remembrance and in hope for the future. We pray your guiding Holy Spirit when we feel crushed by the vastness of pain, illness, and death all around the world. Lord, we pray you will lay your healing hand on all who suffer illness and loss of loved ones. And we also pray for those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, joblessness, bigotry, and so many other social ills. May those with power and resources to address these needs seek your guidance and wait upon you. Help us, dear Lord, to open ourselves to the ways we might use the gifts you've given us to comfort and support others. We know that while we wait, you are here and we praise your holy presence. Friends, as a part of my prayer, I'd like to share a poem, Psalm of an Advent Ear by Edward Hayes. With prayerful pleas and Advent songs of longing, I await the birth of God's anointed one. Come, O gift of heaven's harmony, and attune my third ear, the ear of my heart, so that I may hear, just as Mary, faithful woman of Israel, heard. O oh God, the time is short. These days are too few as I prepare for the feast of the birth of Mary's son. Busy days, crowded to the brim with long lists of gifts to buy and things that must be done. Show to me, also your highly fa favored child, how to guard my heart from noise and hurry's whirl, so that I might hear your voice calling my heart to create an empty space that might be pregnant with heaven's fire. Quiet me within, clothe my body in peacefulness that your word once again may take flesh, this time within me, as once it did in Holy Mary long Advent days ago, amen. God, we lift to you the prayers of this community. We pray for our brother, Lynn Pompa, as he undergoes more medical evaluation for a plural effusion. God bless Lynn, bring recovery and bring health. May he know that he is loved by you and his community. We pray for school, for those who are still going in person, and the students who are at home during this time. God bless those who teach and those who learn that even in this trying time, they might grow together in community. We pray, O oh God, that you would bless Bob and Miriam in their travels to bring Mom O'Hara back to Philadelphia to live with them. God, in this time, keep them safe. Make a way, a path in the wilderness that they might come home swiftly, that all might rest together. God, we give thanks for the prayers for James Custis, and we give thanks that he is out of the hospital and recovering now from COVID. God, remain present with James in his recovery. God, we pray for Ed Bailey, who will have a second eye surgery in January. Make yourself known to him in this anxious time. God, we lift up all those who are experiencing loneliness as a result of the pandemic during this holiday season. Be a comfort and a shield for those who are in need. May they know that they are love and may that love help them abide this time. Pray, oh God, for Anne who suffered a stroke. Be with her in this time, and create a way and a road to recovery. We pray for John Fallon and family whose wife passed from COVID last night. God bless John in his grieving and bless his family as they seek to live without their mother and their wife. We pray thanks 
to you, O oh God, for all those who bring support to others with phone calls and cards and meals. We lift to you Middle Collegiate Church in New York City, which had a major structure fire on Saturday morning. May they be comforted in the wake of this tragedy. May they be emboldened in their mission to love their city. God, we lift to you Stephanie Morris and her family. God, bring comfort, bring care, bring love. We pray, oh God, that you would help students and teachers adjust as virtual school starts again for many this week. God, be with everyone in the midst of this difficult time. We pray for Kathy Collins, who is grieving a sudden passing of her beloved friend, Yolanda. Receive Yolanda, oh God, into your kingdom and comfort Kathy in her grieving. We pray for Linda and Karen and their families as they too are waiting for better days and are longing. We pray, oh God, that you would keep us all safe until we meet again. We pray, oh God, that you would bless our new OPC members who are joining the church today. May they find clear mission for their work ahead and may our love be emboldened by their presence. We pray, oh God, for Ken and Julie Hurlson, who both have COVID, and for their family members who also have it. We pray that my dad in the hospital would find a sense of, of your presence and that you would heal him so that he might come again home. We pray for Gordon, who underwent emergency eye surgery this past Friday. Bless Gordon in his recovery. Pray for two dear mothers and their children as they face challenges and stress. Please, Lord, bring them comfort and peace. We pray for Marcia as she deals with loneliness in this pandemic holiday season. God, may she find a sense of purpose and love at this time. We thank you, O oh God, for the opportunity Edith has been given to attend a new school. May she find it a place where she knows her worth. We thank you, O oh God, for this caring community that lifts, me, uh, that lifts us up and supports family. God, continue to bless Anne Marie and her family at this time. We wish happy birthdays to Karen Tosic Lux. God, we are grateful that Karen is a part of this community, and we pray that she would be blessed on this her birthday. We pray for those who have far less than us. We pray for those without a home, without heat, and those with food insecurity. God, for the needy, we pray that you would make yourself known and that you would embolden us in our mission to serve them. God, we ask for a blessing on all the postal workers, all the FedEx and UPS workers, all the Amazon delivery people, the grocery store delivery people, restaurant delivery workers, and all those working to transport a record number of deliveries in this season. May they be blessed with health and energy and may we really see them in their important labor. God, you are father and mother to us. You are our strength and our shield. And so when we don't have words, we return to the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the beloved of God, it is a true joy and privilege to share with you the peace of Christ, a peace which passes all understanding. So church, the peace of Christ be with you. Church, the blessings of God surround us. They rain down on us day after day as a grace. And so in this time, I encourage you as those who are blessed to return to God what is God's and give as you are able. This is the truth sent from above, the truth of God, the God of love. Therefore, don't turn me from your door. 
But hearken all, both rich and poor. The first thing which I will relate is that God did man create. The next thing which to you I'll tell, woman was made with man to dwell. Then after this was God's own choice to place them both in paradise, there to remain from evil free, except they ate of such a tree. And they did eat which was a sin, and thus their ruin did begin. Ruin themselves, both you and me, and all of their posterity. Thus we were as to endless woes, till God the Lord did interpose, and so a promise soon did run, that he would redeem us by his Son, that he would redeem us by God, take these talents, these gifts, and our lives. Make them grow into a harvest unimaginable to us. Friends, all who are hungry for the bread of life, all who long to drink of the cup of salvation are welcome here. As we enter into this time of communion, I encourage you to grab something to share, something to eat, and something to drink that we might experience God's grace through this common table, though we remain virtual. This day, as we all arrive together at this table, we will receive new members into our community. These are folks that come from east and west, from north and south. They come reared by faithful communities of God's church universal. They come today with gifts that are God-ordained and born of the Spirit. And today we welcome into this church these new ones as beloved members. And so, Overbrook Church, I introduce to you our newest members. Barbara Bean, Gretchen Boger, Lois Davis, Colleen Granada, Joe Gijunas, Rebecca Gijunas, Peggy Ingram, Alan Hoffinger, and Judy Morose. Ask you to welcome them into this church as those with gifts to add to our community. And to you joining this church, this is not my church and this is not our church. This is at center, the church of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus welcomes all, so we welcome you too. Friends, this just as this is not our church, this is also not our table. This is the table of Jesus Christ. This isn't the only table Christ hosts a feast. It is just the table where we all have decided to eat. And we do it with gladness as a community, as those bound in mission and faithfulness. And a place has been set for you at this table before time was set spinning. So we as a church welcome you to this table once more. It is our joy and pleasure to dine with you. And we remain honored that you might choose to dine with us. 
And so to you, as those joining this church, I put these questions to you. Will you, as new members of Overbrook Presbyterian Church, seek Christ's way of love, loving neighbor and loving God? Will you, following the way of Jesus, support the weak, help the afflicted, notice the ignored, protect the vulnerable, love the earth, and support the upbuilding of all people? Will you take serious the scriptures, creeds, and teachings of the church and remain open to the new stirrings of God's spirit in the world? Will you love this church, supporting it in its need and celebrating it in its successes? If so, please say, we do. And Overbrook Presbyterian Church, as we receive these new saints, I put this question to you. Will you honor these new members with your kindness, your patience, your love, and your compassion? Will you care for them when they are sick and call on them when you are in need? Will you listen to their wisdom and will you love their difference? Will you be the church to these new ones? If so, say, we will. Let us pray. God bless these ones. May they find purpose here. May they find mission here. May they find peace here. May they find friends and community here. May they find Christ here. Oh God, make us worthy to receive these new ones. May we be comfort in times of need. May we make beautiful music together. May we be stalwart in our search for justice. May we all of us make some holy trouble together. May we always be nourished by this bread and this cup. Bless these elements that we may be reconciled to each other at this table. May we grow in love and may we laugh as those who have tasted your salvation, O Lord. May we depart from this table, energized to raise up valleys and to lay low mountains so that we all might see and know the true power of your love. This we pray in the name of Christ, the one who troubles the water, the one who prepares the meal. Amen. Friends, let's eat. And as we do, let us remember the old story that becomes new in our retelling. When the night he was betrayed, Jesus sat down at table with his friends. And after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it, giving it to them, saying, this is my body, broken for you. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, we proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of Christ until he comes again. Church, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. So let us eat and let us drink together as one people. And let us sing with joy the praises and glories of God. Come, for all things are now ready. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The cup of Christ, the cup of salvation. And Christmas cookies.
Let us pray. Holy Triune God, we thank you for this meal that proclaims the peace and healing of the nations. We thank you for this meal where a little is enough to change our lives, where a little is more than enough to feed those whose hearts yearn for communion and community. May this bread and fruit of the vine nourish us so that, so that we may grow in the faith and knowledge that in you we are one. Amen. to join us again as a community for the Messiah Sing at three o'clock. But for now, receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May the face of the Lord turn toward you and give you peace. May God's favor be upon you for a thousand generations on your family and your children and their children and their children. May God's presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. God is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and in your going, in your weeping and in your rejoicing. God is for you. Beloved of God, be blessed, be safe, and be at peace until we meet again. Amen. Amen. Amen.